Hello and welcome everybody. Um, we are so excited about this turnout and to have all of you here today with us. Um, we're here today to celebrate Margaret Wrinkle and her beautiful book, Late Migrations. For those of us who once upon a time referred to Margaret as Miss Wrinkle, today is truly a special day. I don't think we will ever forget some of her assignments. Um, I remember one night I was at home, I was lying on the grass underneath our black walnut tree outside my bedroom window and my mom came out and she was like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm doing my homework. <laughs> um, Margaret really uh, taught us how to see the world and to listen to the world and to take that in and to understand it before we ever put a thought on paper. Um, she continues to inspire us today and we are truly grateful that she's here with us. Um, I want to point out that today in our audience we have Harpeth Hall alumni, we have um, some people who have traveled from as far as Massachusetts and New Jersey to be here today. Um, we have parents of alumni, we have uh, students, we have parents of students, we have faculty, and we have members of the community joining us. Um, I am Lee Fitz, I am class of 1991. Um, and I'm Ann Nicholas Weiss, class of 1998. And we are the co-chairs of a new initiative here at Harpeth Hall called Harpeth Hall Connect Her. Um, and this is our first event of many to come. Um, Harpeth Hall Connect Her has been created to foster connections between Harpeth Hall alumni with each other and also with current students. There has been a desire among Harpeth Hall graduates of all ages and professions and stages of life and experience to connect in a way where we can empower and support one another beyond graduation. Um, and that desire has led to the launch of Harpeth Hall Connector. We are going to plan several events uh, throughout the year. And um, these will add on to events that the alumni office has already been uh, putting together for all of us. Um, and we are gonna plan these events both on and off campus we would love to hear your suggestions, so please reach out to the alumni office or anyone on the committee. Um, we also hope that you picked, picked up one of our bookmarks. Um, this, this handy dandy little thing is called a QR code. You can just... You just use your phone and you, take a, you don't even take a picture. You just take the camera and you just hold it over the QR code and it will take you straight to the website. So. It's e as easy as that um, for us that are technically challenged. Uh, we want to give a huge thanks um, to uh, our committee, the Harpeth Hall Connector Committee, and I would love for you all to stand up if you're in the room. Committee members, please. <laughs> I would like to thank them for all of their help um, with our, this event and the events to come. I'd also like to thank uh, Scotty Coombs and Watley Hamilton and the alumni office and also Susan Mole in the development office for all of this, uh, all of their work on this initiative. Um, so thanks again for, to everyone for being here. We're going to hand it over now to Jess Hill, who is our wonderful head of school here at Harpeth Hall. So thank you. Welcome. This is so wonderful that this many people turn out for a book reading. This is, warms my heart as a teacher. Um, I'm so glad that all of you are here. And uh, we're thrilled to have Margaret Wrinkle with us tonight. It is my deepest honor, and I mean that, to have the opportunity to introduce my friend Margaret to you. She has a very special place in my heart. It occurs to me tonight that we all like to be close to greatness in some large or small way. I can only imagine what it is like to have a peripheral friend or acquaintance to receive recognition for her good work, to be admired, and I would even say famous, although she wouldn't say that. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what it would be like to know the person tangentially and to say you were really closer than you are and to try to squeeze your way into her inner circle. 
You might wait for her to step outside in the neighborhood so you can catch a glimpse of her the way groupies would for a rock star from the back exit of a theater. I wouldn't know what it would be like to have already heard a few of those stories about her mother, her grandmother, or that Thanksgiving when she called her father homesick from that godforsaken place, Philadelphia, and cried. <laughs> if she was just someone I knew a little, I am sure I would wish that I had been closer to her for all those years so that I could claim her as one of my own dearest and closest friends without exaggerating, so that I could thank her for being there whenever I needed to talk or vent or laugh about something my husband did or her husband did or some other worry about our teenage children. I would yearn for that closeness and proximity to a person who wrote and spoke so beautifully about love and loss and hope. I don't have to imagine having a dear and close friend who is famous. I have one. So many of you are here because you have one too. She treats all of us like family. She encourages us and mentors us and laughs and cries with us. She is the real deal. And if you don't know her personally, you feel you can claim her as a friend because you have read of her bounty of thoughts, emotions, fears, astonishment, and wonder. When I started teaching at Harpeth Hall near the end of the Jurassic Age, <laughs> Margaret was the brilliant young English teacher at the other end of the building. I was busy trying to plan every minute of my classes in those days because I wanted to make sure I wasn't caught by anything that would throw me off guard. But teaching came as easily to Margaret as breathing. She was a natural. She made the rest of us look like imposters. After a decade of teaching at Harpeth Hall in the 80s, late 80s and 90s, her former students still make pilgrimages just like tonight, to see her. And I know some of them are here, and I'm so glad you all are. And now, I am so happy that her prose has touched the hearts and minds of thousands and thousands of readers. Margaret is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and each Monday, we can all begin our week with her latest thoughts on the flora, fauna, culture, and politics of the American South. She is the past editor of Chapter 16, an online publication produced by Humanities Tennessee, which provides literary coverage of the news and events in Tennessee. She is a graduate of Auburn University and the University of South Carolina, and we are so grateful that she lives right here in Nashville with her husband, Haywood Moxley, English teacher and, and at MBA and department chair of English. He is her, her number one supporter and encourager of, of his wife's work. If you have already read Late Migrations, I suspect you are here for a little more, perhaps an epilogue of the book. You may be here to gather one more bit of wisdom or hear the author's voice and picture that rural Alabama childhood more vis vividly. Perhaps you want to tap into her astonishment at the ecosystem around us every day along with the fragility of life we must endure. For those who haven't read it, it is one to treasure and share and read and reread and share and read again. Don't take it from me. Ann Patchett states that it is beautifully written, masterfully structured, and brimming with insight into the natural world. Richard Powers says Margaret Wrinkle's deft juxtapositions close up the gap between humans and non-humans and revive our lost kinship with other living things. That is enough. No more from me. I hand it over to Margaret at this time. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really glad to be home. I've been traveling um, since late migrations came out on July 9th. And um, let's just say <laughs> the audiences I had other places are not like this one. 
I am very grateful to see so many former students and parents of former students and former colleagues. I, I really, I, I haven't been at Harbeth Hall since 1997 as a teacher, but I do feel that I've come home. Thank you. Um, when a writer is on book tour, there are, um, you start to see patterns in the questions that people ask in the Q&A section. And so I thought I would just structure this talk a little bit around what people in other places have wanted to know. Um, some of what they wanted to know are maybe one of a kind questions. One uh, woman asked me whether I would rather, uh, whether I would prefer to be shot by a shotgun <clears throat> or have natural childbirth. Uh, another uh, fella in the audience asked me how Donald Trump got elected president of the United States. And so I, um, but, but aside from the strange, unexpected questions, the question that comes up most often, over and over and over again, and sometimes more delicately than others, it basically boils down to, you're 57 years old, what took you so long to write a book? And so I thought I would tell the story of how late migrations came to be a little bit. Um, and, and answer the question, how does somebody get to be 57 and finally become a debut author? The answer to that question is really by accident. I didn't, I wasn't thinking that I was writing a book. I didn't plan to write a book. Um, writing a book was not some lofty goal that I had held before me for decades. Um, I always, always thought of myself as a writer. I can't remember a time when I didn't think of myself as a writer. Um, even as a very young, I'm gonna try to do this. I haven't practiced this because I was having technical difficulties. Um, I'm gonna try to see if this works. Um, I always thought I was a, gonna be a nature writer when I was a child. I, um, I like to make friends with my, um, backyard neighbors. Um, when I was in college, I was a volunteer for the Wildlife Rescue Service. I um, bottle fed squirrels. And, um, and then when they got old enough to be released into the wild, um, there was a protocol for doing that. Um, some of them were more charming than others. Um, <laughs> But I, I really, I loved them all. And I loved them, I loved helping them, but I also loved observing them. Um, so uh, I spent a lot of my youth and my childhood outdoors. Um, and I wrote about what I saw. I wrote about my garden. That's all the tomatoes off uh, one, one, one day's haul, my first vegetable garden. And I was still writing even after this happened. Um, the, the, uh, our honeymoon, when Haywood and I got married, was um, a, an 8,000 mile journey across America, mainly in state parks and natural areas. Um, but a lot of my inspiration once I came to Harpeth Hall were the students themselves. Um, Lee was, uh, whoops, I didn't mean to go that far. There's, there, there, there I am teaching. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I threw that in for fun. Um, but, but my students, my writing students, um, I, I, I try to think of um, assignments that I would like to write, and then I tried to um, right along with them. That's Julia Harrison. I think that's about 1991, maybe. But then I stopped teaching at Harpeth Hall um, to work full-time as a writer for magazines and newspapers. Um, but by then, I was writing about other wild creatures. <laughs> the, three, the three I gave birth to, mainly, um, and the things I thought about as a young mother. Um, I think uh, writing this book has made me think of so many stories that I hadn't thought about in decades. Um, writing it and then later talking about it with readers. I, something reminded me recently of a, of a thing that happened when my youngest child was six weeks old. 
we had gone to the Moxley family reunion and uh, my husband has five brothers and sisters and one of my cute young sisters-in-law who did not have children whose breasts were not leaking milk um, showed up with bangs. She had, had, she had a new haircut and I thought maybe I would feel better if I had bangs. <laughs> And it was, um, I saw my mother-in-law sewing shears on the kitchen table, and I walked back to the bathroom and gave myself bangs. And I was uh, sleep deprived and cutting backwards, and I kept trimming a little more and a little more trying to even it up, and made a really a terrible mess of things. And so when I went back into the kitchen to set the sewing shears down, my mother-in-law, who was a saint, she looked at me and she said, oh, it makes so much sense to have bangs when you're a young mother. And I said, why? <laughs> and she said, because you're always looking down. That was the way she was. She was always looking on the bright side but I think that explains partly why it took me until I was 57 to write a book. I was always looking down. I had spent my youth looking out. I had spent my childhood being out. But as a young mother and then later um, as my parents were getting sick and growing old, um, everything was much closer in. I had The focus was in. and. And um, my youngest child was two years old when my father was diagnosed with stage four esophageal cancer. So there was never a period for me between caregiving of small children and caregiving of failing elders. Um, my parents had an unfathomably happy marriage. That was taken at the Christmas before my father died um, in February. So when he died, my mother was lost. And she needed a lot of help emotionally at first. But as the years passed, she needed a lot of pra practical help. And ultimately, it was more help, really, than I could give from Nashville when she was in Birmingham. So uh, we moved uh, her. Through an act of divine intervention, I'm convinced that the little rental house across the street from my family became available right when it became very obvious that she could no longer live safely alone, and we moved her to Nashville. She lived the last almost three years of her life um, as a member of our family, but with her own stuff, her own stuff in her own place. Um, but she died very suddenly, and after what had happened with my dad, two and a half years of cancer, I was completely caught off guard. I, my grandmother lived to be 97. My great-grandmother lived to be 96. I thought I was going to have my mother for another decade or more, and I was really hardly functioning. The grief was so, un and shock was so unbearable. Um, and almost immediately after she died, my husband's parents moved to Nashville. My father-in-law needed a heart valve replacement. He was my mother-in-law's caregiver. She had, she had very advanced Parkinson's disease. And so we went straight from grief into very, very intense caregiving again. And it wasn't long before my beloved mother-in-law was in hospice care. That year at the Southern Festival of Books, I ran into Clay Risen, who is um, a former student of my husband's. He's also a, a writer. You may recognize his name right now because he's, his new book uh, called The Crowded Hour is about Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, and it's everywhere. You, he, he's been on, on national public radio. He's been reviewed everywhere. And anyway, he was at the Southern Festival of Books with an earlier book, and he was asking about the family, and I was telling him just really how 
terrible things were, and he said, would you ever want to write about that? And I had stopped writing. I hadn't written a word in five years beyond the work I needed, to, the writing I needed to do for my job as an editor. And I just was really, it stopped me in my tracks. Would I ever want to write about that? And I thought he meant, you're a writer. That's how writers understand the world. They write it until they can make sense of things. Uh, as it turns out, that's not what he meant at all. He, he um, uh, in his day job, he's the deputy editor of the op-ed section of the New York Times, and they were about to start a new, a new uh, series called The End, about end-of-life issues. And they hadn't started it yet. They didn't have anything in their inventory. It was not a column he edited, but he said if I wanted to write something about it, he would get it to the right editor and, and let her take a look. And I just thought, no way. I am right in the thick of it. But there was just this little nagging thing in the back of my mind, would you ever want to write about it? And I thought, well, maybe I'll try. Maybe I'll just spend 15 minutes a day, first thing in the morning, just writing a little bit and just see where it goes. See if it does help. See if it does make me feel a little bit more in control of this swirling chaos of grief and worry. And by the end of that month, I had written one essay. Back in my full-time writing days, it would have taken me a Sunday afternoon when Haywood was home to play with the kids to write an, one essay. But it was an essay that would not have existed if I hadn't tried. And as it happens, the New York Times did buy it. I had been trying for years before I took an editing job to sell a story to the New York Times with no luck at all, and this one they took. And it became the first essay that ultimately I wrote for this book. So I thought I would start by just the first piece I would read would just be the first page of this essay. It's called No Exit. Marry an orphan, my mother used to say, and you can always come home for Christmas. <laughs> she did say that. What she should have said, marry an orphan, or you'll have four parents to nurse through every torment life doles out on the long, long path to the grave. But I married the opposite of an orphan, the son and grandson of people who live deep into old age despite diseases that commonly fail others, cancer, sepsis, heart failure, emphysema, you name it. My husband's elders get sick, and then they get sicker, but for years they persevere. My own father died of cancer five days shy of his 75th birthday. Mom dropped dead of a hemorrhagic stroke at 80. When I checked on her the night before her death, she was eating a cookie and watching a rerun of JAG. I almost pointed out that eating in bed is a choking hazard, <laughs> but for once I let it go. She was in good health, but she needed my help in countless annoying ways, annoying to her and annoying to me, and she was heartily sick of being told what to do. I take some comfort now in knowing I skipped that one last chance to boss her around. There's an art to helping people without making them feel bad about needing help. It's an art I was learning but hadn't wholly mastered with mom. I would have died if my mother had done this to me when I was your age, she said when she moved in across the street. But by the time she actually died three years later, we had both adjusted. I know I can be a bitch sometimes, but you can be a bitch sometimes too, she would say. I figure it all works out in the wash.
Oh, I skipped the picture. That's my in-laws. I meant to show you that when I was talking about them. The writing of that essay, it must have dislodged something in me. It must have broken some kind of dam because I started another essay and another essay and another essay and another essay, but I was writing them honestly 15 minutes a day, just in little bitty drips and drabs. And so that's one reason why these essays are so short is because the time I had to devote to them was also very short. Um, so, uh, that, those, that writing, the writing of the family essays, that went on for about a year, or a, actually a little less than a year, and then the primary season leading to the 2016 presidential campaign got into full swing and depressed me. It was just so ugly and so disheartening to see how angry uh, my fellow Americans had become. And I thought it was temporary. I honestly had never heard of Donald Trump before the primary season, and I thought it was temporary. I thought he would, ooh, I thought he would, um, <laughs> I thought he would just lose and go away. And then he didn't lose. And so I thought I needed somehow to tap into something more permanent, something less personal. I thought I needed to go back to the kind of person I had been as a child. I needed to spend more time outdoors. I needed to spend more time paying attention to the great rhythms of the natural world, the cycles that are in, uh, disinterested in the things that were filling the headlines. And so I started writing these little nature essays too. And it took me a, a pretty long time, I would say probably a whole year, before I started to see that these things were really the same. They, they were sort of the same essay, but just focused on different subjects. They were essays about what I loved and why I loved them. And they were emphasizing kinship kinship with family, kinship with friends, kinship with the creatures in my backyard. So uh, I thought I would read you one of the little nature essays. This one's called The Snow Moon. Whoops. Oh, that one went with um, the No Exit essay. There's the snowman. Here in this first ring suburban neighborhood, we are far from the spongy paths of the forest peoples who gave this moon its name. But we are not far from the snow moon itself, which rises through the bare trees as it has done since long before we were here, since long before the forest peoples were here. The world is warming now, and the, this year, the snow moon heralds no snow. The bluebirds are peeking into the sun-drenched nest box. The star magnolia is in full bloom long before its time. But still, the snow moon rises between the black branches in our postage stamp yards, as lovely as it has ever been. Untouched by our rancor, unmoved by our despair. Let the earth cast a shadow across its golden glow. Let the green-headed comet streak past on its journey through the darkness. Still the snow moon rises and sets as it must. It has never burned and it will never darken. All its light is borrowed light. Its steadfast, steadfast path is tied to ours. The snow moon brought a time of hunger to the forest peoples, 
But we are fat in our snug houses, tethered to the shine of our screens. The snow moon is our hungry sister. The snow moon is our brighter twin. So once I realized that the family essays and the nature essays could exist side by side, I started also seeing that the family essays began so often in the natural world. So then what I was imagining was a book that would have one, then the other, then one, then the other, and all of a sudden that arrangement got mixed up because it was hard to say, well, is this the family essay or is this a nature essay? It's hard to say. So I thought I'd read one that kind of where you start to see them blend together. This one's called In the Storm, Safe from the Storm. At my grandparents' house in the country, we live on the front porch where the ceiling fan blows the bugs away and stirs the steaming air into something passing for a breeze. At home in town, we are very modern and have no porch at all. There's a concrete stoop, but only the barest overhang to cover it, hardly anything to keep away the rain or the blistering sun. When a storm comes, my father sets his chair right in the doorway, straddling the jam. I love the storms. If I'm asleep, he lifts me up and carries me through the dark house to sit with him in the doorway and listen to the wind and the thunder. The rain comes and I feel it with the tips of my toes but they are the only parts of me that get wet, for I have drawn my knees up to my chest under my nightgown, and my father has unbuttoned his corduroy jacket and pulled it around me and wrapped his arms around me too. I lean into him. I feel the heat from his body and the cool rain from the world, both at once. By this time, a year and a half or so into these weird little essays I was writing that were very short, some of them only about a paragraph long, I, I, uh, I, I met Mary Laura Philpot, who I, I had actually met her a few times, but one day I got this email from her out of the clear blue sky. Um, she had written some essays and she was thinking that she might put them together in a book and would I mind taking a look? And we agreed that we, we needed to form a writer's group and we found some other folks who, um, who were writing essays and thinking about putting them into the book. If, if y'all don't know Mary, Mary Laura, her, um, her essay collection beat mine into print by three months. It came out in April. It's called I Miss You When I Blink and it also is a memoir in essays. But one day we were, we were just reading things that we were writing to each other and, and we were all giving each other advice. And, and then one day, I don't remember if it was Mary Laura, if it was Maria Browning, or if it was Susanna Feltz or Carrington Fox, but one of them said to me, you know you're writing a book. And I didn't know I was writing a book, but it had sort of, I had sort of started to think that they could go together, but I didn't know if anybody else would see that. You know you're writing a book. And so um, once I really committed to that idea, it, I started seeing little places where I, could, I needed to write a specific thing to fill in the gap. So if you're going to write a book about grief, if you're going to write a book about love and loss, you need people to understand what it is you lost. And so I started writing some, some specifically for the book, and I thought I'd read one of these. This one's called The Way You Look at Me.
You might need to know that my parents didn't get married until my mother was 29 and my father was 33. At the, in 1960, the year they got married, the average bride was 18 years old and the average groom was 21. So my grandparents have been waiting a long time <laughs> for grandchildren. The way you looked at me. Here are all my kin, my mother and my father, my grandmother and my grandfather, my great-grandmother in the placid wholeness of her white halo, arrayed around me. Born too early, tiny and frail, I am sleeping in every picture, and in every picture they are gathered around me, heads bent to watch me take each too light breath. I am too small and always cold, but my people are looking at me as if I were the sun. As if they had been cold every day of their lives till now. I am the sun, but they are not the planets. They are the universe. When I uh, submitted this book for uh, possible publication to Milkweed, the publisher who ultimately bought the book, it, it took a, it was a different, I had in mind a different structure for it. But I always had in mind that my words and my brother's art would be paired as part of the project. My brother, Billy, is a year younger than I am. We were raised in that time-honored way of Catholic children as Irish twins. And he's an artist, and from our earliest, earliest age, we made little books to give our people, our parents, our grandparents, our friends, and we worked together on student publications. I was the high school newspaper editor, he was the art director. I was the college magazine editor, he was the art director. We went to graduate school together, I was getting a master's degree in creative writing, he was getting a master's degree in fine art. And so it just made sense to me that he would be part of this process. It wasn't, um, it wasn't that hard to convince the publisher that he needed to be involved too as soon as they saw his work. But coming up with the right way to do the art was a little um, confusing at first. We, we didn't, I, I had imagined that we would use existing artwork. Um, Milkweed had imagined that Billy would make original pieces of art for the book itself, and that's what he ended up doing. His plan, which I think is really so smart, was not to try to illustrate the family essays but to take the nature essays and make them feel like family. So you can see um, this, is, uh, this piece of art is called um, Peaches. You can see the family. Um, this is um, about the monarch butterfly. This is about, do you remember the piebald fawn that they had out at Radnor Lake a couple of years ago? What you'll see are these um, little frames around each image, those are actual uh, little paper frames in um, antique photo albums. And so he created this, um, these original pieces of art to go with certain essays throughout. And visually, those picture frames are sort of working in the background to remind you that we're all family. So I thought I would, uh, I would close by reading one of the pieces that Billy's in. Creek Walk. The rocks are gray slate, massive slabs cantilevered over the water as though the outstretched feathers of a great prehistoric bird had been caught in stone. My brother and I are barefoot. The pads of our feet are thick, toughened by concrete and asphalt and gravel roads. 
And anyway, shoes would be useless on this slick rock, worse than useless. We have not discussed a plan, and so we are making our way to the creek with no real intention. We have nowhere to be and nothing to do for hours on end, for days and days on end. It is summer, and autumn is inconceivable to us. School will be reinvented every year, an astonishment every year. Where were the nuns all hiding while we were walking barefoot <laughs> on the hot concrete? We're not thinking of school or of the nuns. We are thinking of nothing. Or perhaps we are wondering if we will see another rattlesnake. Seeing any snake would be a cause for remark, but we have only once seen a rattlesnake. Mainly, we will turn over rocks on the bank of the creek looking for worms and roly-polies. We aren't fishing. No one has ever taken us fishing. We are not the kind of children who would enjoy fishing. But we know we can summon fish by tossing worms into the water. And we like to feel the fish mousing, mouthing the freckles on our legs. Sometimes there are salamanders on the bank. Sometimes there are tadpoles in the foamy water at the edges of the backwash. Sometimes there are crawdads under the rocks that jut into the water. Always there are dragonflies, blue and bottle green and scarlet red, hovering over the flashing water. Always there are jays scolding from the dark pines. We see them and we don't see them. We hear them and we never register their sound. The mud and the moving water smell vaguely of decay, but the smell does not disturb us or inspire the first curiosity. We have never even noted it. These are our sights and our sounds and our smells, as casual to us as the sound of our own blood in our ears as we hang down the biggest as we lie down on the biggest rock and hang our edge, heads over the edge to dangle tickle tails into the water tricking the fish into rising farther down closer to the highway there are words scratched into the slate on the other bank the letters are large and ghostly white f u c k my brother sounds it out, a perfect practice word for someone still learning phonics from the adventures of David and Anne, <laughs> the Catholic school equivalent of Dick and Jane. <laughs> he pronounces it correctly, then what does it mean? It's a word people say when they're mad, I tell him. I don't know what it means. We pick our way back toward the bank we climb to start heading home. Clouds of minnows race from our feet. Clouds of grasshoppers rise from the timothy grass above the rocks. Clouds of gnats hover above the water, part for our small bodies, and coalesce again behind us. We climb out and sit together on the slanted rock to wait for our feet to dry in the hot sun. At home, it is almost time for supper, but we can't tell time. Do y'all have any questions? Not about the election or about guns. Anything else I'll answer. Hello. Kate, Kate Sherrard. 
Um, I had Miss Frankel when in, I was a sophomore, and I, it was 1990, and I was in an honors class, and I was terrified. <laughs> uh, anyway, my question for you is, um, I have lots of questions, but the one I want to ask is, um, when you write these very deep, internal sort of essays of, of your very deepest musings on things, do you just sit down and think, I'm going to write now, I've got 30 minutes and I'm going to write it, or does it have to kind of come to you and then you have to, do you jot down notes and then go and try to put it together? I'm just more, I want to know about your process on that. When I was really in the thick of writing this, it was, it was, um, they were almost practically writing themselves, honestly. I mean, I would be driving down the road, and a, an idea would come to me, and I would dictate it to Siri while I was driving, and then I would just type it up, and my favorite part of writing is revising, so getting that first thing down is really great when Siri does that for me. But um, in the beginning, it was hard to find the time. It was too easy to put it aside, even a little bit of time. So um, I, I developed, I was, uh, one, one manifestation of grief for me was insomnia, and I was trying to, um, I finally just surrendered to it, and I just said, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to write, and I was writing in an actual notebook, so I didn't bother anybody, and I would leave that notebook open all day long, and later, when I had transcribed it into a a Word document, I would leave it up on the screen, just always running in the background. And it was a lot easier to come back to it than it was to start. So for me, it was the key thing was developing this strategy that I'm going to do it every morning, first thing, before anybody else is awake, um, or if I, if I happen to sleep after everybody left for school, that would be the first thing. Because if I waited until I was in the middle of the work day or cooking supper or whatever, it was not ever going to happen. And coming back to it at night was, I was way too tired then. So it, it was just for me, just to, I mean, I've become this almost a proselytizer about when, about looking up. You know, that time when you look down has to eventually, you have to come back to looking out again, but it doesn't have to, you don't need a sabbatical. You just need to t tell yourself, I'm going to give myself 15 minutes a day to be what I say I am. That's not so much. And it's a little bit at a time, 15 minutes a day kind of adds up, it, you know, if you're not in a hurry. <laughs> Somebody else have a question? Your book is so beautiful, really. and. Um, it's hard to tell where the prose sto stops and the poetry begins. I think I read that you always wanted to write poetry, or you do write, and so I want to know the history of that. Did you used to write poetry? Do you write I poetry? I did. I did um, poetry exclusively when I was um, in graduate school. And that's what I was studying. And my, my master's thesis is a collection of poems. When I was teaching at Harpeth Hall, I was writing poetry and sending it out to literary magazines. Um, and I remember when I first, when, when Clyde first said to me, would you ever want to write about that? My first thought was that it was time to go back to poetry because poetry is so short. You know, I thought I, I, I need something like that, something that could be self-contained and I could work on it and come back to it and not get lost in where I had left off. Um, but it just, nothing I was writing wanted to sort itself into lines. It had been so long since I had written, written poetry that I just, I just finally kind of gave in and said, okay, well, I guess I'm writing really, really, really short essays. So they're, they're, it's nonfiction. It's, um, they're written in sentences. They're subject, verb, object sentences. But, um, but I guess I do kind of think of them as more like poems than like other kinds of prose. Hi, uh, Julia Sutherland, class of 90. Hey, good to see you. Oh, there you, you are. I know, sorry. Hey, Julia. I wasn't going to stand up. Um, so you have a very distinctive voice in your writing, 
but those of us who have been privileged enough to have you teach us or know us know that you also have a very distinctive speaking voice. <laughs> and as I was reading your book, I realized that I have the privilege of having your voice in my head while I'm reading the book. I was curious, when you've been traveling and people come to hear you for the first time, has anyone commented on that? Or I, I sort of think, oh, well, it might be interesting to not know what you sounded like when I was reading the book, but it's wonderful. I don't think anybody, I don't recall anybody saying anything about that, but it's funny you say that because I read everything I write out loud. Uh, it ha I have to hear it. Um, my dog thinks I'm reading to her, which is great. Kind of a little bonding, a little writing, but I, I don't, um, I, even the stuff I write for the Times, I, when I'm not trying to be overtly lyrical, I have to hear it to know whether it's finished or not. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I've never successfully written fiction, is that the sound, my own voice is the voice I hear more than I am able to hear other, other voices. It is unless I, like, I've taken a couple weeks off this summer because of uh, book and family stuff. But it's online every Monday. And sometimes it's also in print on Monday. Sometimes it's in print on Tuesday. Um, this is a pretty big group for me to say this is under the cone of silence. But here, here's the truth. <laughs> Y'all don't tell anybody I told you this. But... For it to be in print, it needs to be in 800 to 900 word range. And my natural length is 11 to 1200 words. So because of the way the, the system works, when the editors have to edit it for the online system and then edit it again for the print system, my editor doesn't want to do that. And I don't want to write 800 words. So mostly, I shoot for writing what I want to write, and he shoots for getting it online only. If it picks up some traction um, in the traffic, or if there's a, a, the, the arrangement of other pieces for that day are a little too heavy on one subject, and we can guess what that is, they might pull mine out and stick it in the next day's paper. But it, the Times itself, as far as I can see, doesn't make a huge distinction. They don't. Some online publication, some publications make like a pay difference if it's for the website or they call it the blog rather than the, the actual publication. But there's no such distinction. About 75% of the people who have a subscription to the New York Times have an online only subscription. So even if you have a print, so there's a ton of copy that is only online. And even if you get the print edition, you probably ought to be reading online anyway, or you're going to be missing a lot of stuff. So in, a, in um, addition, if you will, to nature and family, what would you say you hold closest or uh, feeds you or inspires you? Um, other people's writing. I don't think you can, I can't imagine being a writer without also being a reader. I think um, I can't sleep if I don't have time with a good book right before I close my eyes. It, it's centering to me. Mm -hmm. And there's so much great writing out there and so many different kinds of great writing that, um, you know, I guess if I, I've never had what I would consider a writer's block, but if I had one, I think all I would need to do is read something really beautiful. Um, because it's, I think it's a natural human trait when you see some, kids want to copy what they see. And I think that that's what writers do too. They go, oh, so you can write a book about a hawk and a dead father. You know, you can sort of see how these things actually work together. 
um, when you see somebody else do it. Hello, Hi. I'm Maggie Sullivan, Harpethal class of 2020. Um, <laughs> Hi, Maggie. And I was lucky enough to have you, you don't bother craning your necks, people. Um, <laughs> and I was lucky enough to have you in my English class last year. You were a joy, thank you for that. So my question is, um, I am lucky to have been raised by a father who is a teacher, and he became a teacher when I was in third grade, and whenever I see him teach, there are a lot of echoes of how I saw him when I was younger because he teaches little kids. Yeah. And I was wondering, since you experienced teaching first and then later motherhood, if you know there were echoes of that teaching experience in motherhood and in writing. I think that becoming a mother, I, um, I, I continued to teach until my first child was five, year, five and a half. So, but I, and I do think it changed, being a mother changed how I thought about my students. For a long time, especially when I first started teaching at Harpeth Hall, I was 25 years old. And I had 18 year olds in my senior class. And I had acne. And the only difference between them and me, as far as the lunch ladies were concerned, was that I didn't have on a kilt. So for, for the first few years that I was teaching, uh, and you know, my younger sister is uh, six and a half years younger than I am, it felt like I was teaching my peers or people who were very close to being my peers. But once Sam was born, all of a sudden, everybody became my child. I mean, they, they, I felt like um, it, it was just a shift in the way I, I thought about the, the students um, and the way I loved them, I think, was, was much more maternal. Um, to what extent did you consider an audience when you were writing this and what is it you want your audience to take away from this book? I didn't consider the audience in any way. Not at all, because I didn't think there would be an audience. <laughs> For a really long time. And, um, and I, as a reader, I'm always very, I'm almost offended when I feel the writer explaining too much to me. It's like, I want, I want to be trusted as a reader. I want to be, I want the writer to, to, I want the writer to take me up to here and let me make a little leap. I don't like it when the leap is this big. I don't want to be confused, but I also don't want to be led. And so in writing this book, I tried to find that gap, the one that lets the reader, that trusts the reader to f come with me, um, but doesn't spell it out. Um, I don't know if I was successful in doing that, but I was, I, I would not have, if an editor had said to me, we think this needs to be a straightforward narrative, we don't want it to be written in little pieces, we want you to fill in the gaps, I would have said, no thanks, there won't be a book, because that's just not what I wanted to write. Is that all? One more. Um, thank you, first of all. And also, um, just curious, any reflections now that you've been on tour? Has it led you to think about what may be next or if you would continue exploring another book or um, um, what that experience has led to? My agent would very much like me to have another book proposal written by the end of this year. And, and I have some ideas. Um, three specific ideas, but I, writing an, a weekly column is a lot of writing. It's not for a real journalist, for a real journalist. Real journalists have three deadlines a day, but um, for me, the kind of writing I do, one, one a week is a lot, especially on book tour. So I've sort of told myself I'm going to give myself permission to put that question off until after the book tour is over and I, and I can breathe again. But I think there will be, there'll be another book. I just don't know which one yet, or when, or anything about it. 
Thank you all. Thank you, Margaret, for making our night. Thank you so much for being here. This was wonderful. Can't wait for the next book, right? Thank you. You got a present?